title of tonight's lesson is Maintaining Hope and Trust in a Pandemic. And of course, our speaker is Wayne Jones. Denny's going to have the closing remarks, so I'm just going to go ahead and say, great sermon, Wayne, I tell you, and uh, because I know it's going to be good. I know it's going to be good. You're going to be blessed tonight by a good, good lesson. Wayne is a dear friend, and we are so blessed to have he and Shana Kay here at the congregation at Bear Valley, as well as Carson and Bailey, two of their four daughters, and uh, they have been such good workers in the kingdom, and uh, they've done a lot over the years in various congregations. They uh, Wayne graduated from the Memphis School of Preaching and then at some point along the way ended up at San Marcos for about 14, 15 years. And uh, while he was there, uh, one of the great works that he started was uh, a preacher's workshop called Focal Point. And that continues to go on. He's going to have a directorship role in that uh, at least this next year and maybe longer. And uh, we uh, invite you to consider that and think about that as well and attending that in the May, uh, May time frame each year. Also, you might be interested in tuning in to his uh, podcast on the Light Network called Authentically Adam. And I know that uh, there are a lot of other things that Wayne does. He is uh, what we like to refer to around here as the darling of the faculty now because, you know, the first time a student faculty member comes in, everybody loves him. And uh, they, we, all we've heard all semester long is Wayne Jones, Wayne Jones. Well, of course, they haven't received their final grade yet, so that may change. <laughs> But, uh, but no, Wayne does a great job. He is dearly loved because of his sincerity and uh, his fervor and his knowledge of Scripture. So, Wayne, we're glad that you're here. Come and preach to us, brother. I will freely admit to you that I feel a little bit strange this evening. Um, generally, when the lectures are coming to a close, we are looking at our flight schedule back to Texas, uh, making sure that we're checked in and then checked out, and we get home and we continue the work. So I really don't know what to do uh, tonight. I feel like that I could preach a lot longer than 40 minutes because I just have to drive south a little bit uh, when all of this is over. And so um, let me just say how thankful I am to every member of the Bear Valley congregation for the events of this weekend. Um, I know that uh, something like this does not happen because one or two people put their hand to the plow, but because everyone is invested. And so thank you. Uh, as one of your fellow members, thank you for all that you've done, for the staff of the school, um, for all the speakers. I, I told Donnie I might just get up and say ditto, all for the Lord's invitation, let's go home, because it has been a tremendous Tremendous series of lessons, and I have been blessed uh, for that. Its arrival was unexpected, wasn't it? You see, as, as human beings, we tend to be caught off guard by the instability and the uncertainty of the physical world that we live in. I mean, even though some live in areas where natural disasters are common, the appearance of a funnel cloud the turn of a hurricane in the Gulf or the, the, the rise of a thunderstorm that, that flash floods the highway catches us off guard. We're unprepared. We're surprised at those things. People who live in floodplains often have inadequate insurance to cover what happens when the floods actually come because the assumption is it won't happen to me or it won't happen in my lifetime or it won't happen this year. And so there's no need to prepare and to be ready because those things catch us off guard. Similarly, we have dealt with a series of medical health-related crises in the past 50 years in our world. And seemingly, we have been unprepared for every one of them. Even if we were prepared, our reactions indicate that we weren't ready. The fear and, and the lamenting and the scrambling and the uncertainty give indication that while we might have assumed something like that could happen, and history tells us that it might, we weren't ready in our generation and our time to deal with it. Now, as servants of the Most High God, I believe we should be caught off guard the least when it comes to the shifting world that we live in. From a change in, in regime to a change in weather to a change in circumstance or economy, we 
as Bible students should understand, that's how the world works, right? You think about the number of times in Scripture that, that sudden changes of a drastic nature came upon people and how the Bible speaks of them as if they were common occurrences or everyday activities. We studied last night from the book of Daniel. You know, when that, the handwriting appeared, the, the finger appeared and the hand wrote on the wall and, and, and it was promised that that kingdom would fall. You know what the Bible says in Daniel 5 and verse 30? That same night, Belshazzar the Chaldean, the king was slain. That very night, it, 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 was, it was promised one, one hour and he was gone the next. And a total shift in world power at the blink of an eye. We should be used to that as Bible students. I think to the first chapter of, of Job, and maybe that's where your mind went. How that there was a day when Job's sons and daughters had gathered together to, to celebrate and, and to eat and to join one another's company. And, and while they were there, a series of calamities. Job found out that, that, it, that his oxen and his donkeys were stolen, that his servants were killed. And while that messenger was still in the house, still relaying that message to Job, another came and, and said that his sheep and his servants were burned up. And while, and while the, the sentences were still fresh in his mouth, another servant arose, came to Job, told him about the raid on his camels and the loss of his servants. And as that one was still speaking, news came by another messenger that a violent windstorm had beat upon the house where his children were gathered and they were all dead. In the blink of an eye, a change in circumstance, tragedy brought about, we should be ready for these things. I don't know, I'm convinced that our access to daily food and our general health, the way that it is in our culture and in our country, makes us numb to the reality of tragedy it's why we're surprised friends we can't live only on milk and honey and not on faith and hope because one day the milk and honey is going to dry up at some point in our lives we're going to face uncertainty if it's all been 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 blessings and benefits and not struggles and difficulties we're still going to stand surprised we're not going to consider the what ifs and the so what's in pandemics and struggles and difficulties if we're not ready for them I know we wouldn't verbalize it, but I think sometimes we live with the theology of the scoffers of 2 Peter chapter 3. Everything's been like it is now since the beginning of time, when we know it hasn't. But we live as if nothing will change and nothing will be different. If we're not careful, not only will we not, will we not be prepared for the physical calamities, but we won't be prepared for the spiritual calamities that follow. I said all of that to say this, maybe we needed to address the idea of having hope and trust in the midst of a pandemic before 2020. Maybe we needed to envision and consider what might happen and how the church might respond and if we were prepared. And I don't mean by that if we already had live stream cameras and if we already had the bandwidth to run them. I mean, what are we going to do if tragedy strikes the church on our soil in our country and those that are less than committed began to fade to the background. How are we going to get them back? What's our agenda and our plan going to be? I would ask you, but I know the answer. Did 2020 catch you off guard? On March the 12th, the NBA canceled their season. On the 13th, actually I think it was the 11th, on the 13th we were supposed to leave for a mission trip to Jamaica. We didn't cancel that trip until the wee hours of the night of March the 12th. Had we arrived there, we would have the next day been sent back home because they were shutting their borders. You know, it caught me so off guard, I told Shannon Kay, I'm going to the store and I'm going to stand in line because I want to tell my grandchildren about this. I assumed it would be over in a week or two. I really don't want to talk about standing in line anymore or shortages, or, or, or separation, or masks. I don't, I'm not, I don't want to tell my grandchildren about that. In fact, I want to teach them something better than maybe the way we acted during that. But it did catch us off guard. Its arrival was, was sudden. Its cause is uncertain. I really think that, that, I, that, that stating this might be obvious, and 
and it might even be offensive, but, but it needs to be stated. Having a Facebook account or a Twitter handle does not automatically make us a medical doctor, a political analyst, a palm reader, or part of the president's inner circle. It just doesn't. I know there are all kinds of, of, of conjecture and, and, and suspicion and, and rumors and definite opinions about why we're suffering what we're suffering and why we had what we had and why we, 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 we dealt with what we dealt with. But the truth of the matter is we don't know. I think there are probably at least four reasons that we could put as possibilities. Coronavirus may have reared its head and we may have dealt with what we dealt with from 2020 until now because of time and chance. It's very possible. Time and chance. The Bible says that, that it happens to every man. And that time and chance that Solomon talks about in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, I believe was set in order by the things that God prescribed in chapter 3. There's a time to plant and a time to build. A time to, to reap and a time to sow. There, there's a time to, to, to tear down and build up. And, and perhaps just the seasons of life suggest that's the time that we're in. I have suspicion that there's more than that. But it's possible that simply what we're dealing with and what we have dealt with, the pandemic that we are addressing in this lesson and how we respond to it was simply a matter of time and chance. Might also be, second cause, sin running its natural course. But there is no death or disease without sin, is there? There is no difficulty and, and problems and health issues and, and respiratory problems without sin. Created perfect and put in a perfect place to live forever until sin entered the picture. And so perhaps, in keeping with time and chance, sin is just following its natural course in a fallen world and we're dealing with the impact and effects of it. Sin leads to death. It creates chaos. It divides nations. It hurts churches. It erodes trust. It creates suspicion. And that's the world that we now live in. So perhaps it's just sin running its course. A third possibility. Perhaps we are dealing with what we're dealing with because God is bringing someone to their knees. Now, who is that someone? I wouldn't dare to suggest. Certainly not in a public forum where it's being recorded and everyone can go and quote it later. But I don't know. But God does that, doesn't he? He did that, didn't he? And so perhaps he's bringing someone to their knees. Or maybe, maybe God's bringing someone to his side. Maybe he's drawing us under the shadow of his wing. And he's saying, trust me. Depend on me. Be sustained by me. The wealth and the health that you had... You didn't need it to be who you were. It didn't define your worth. It didn't give you purpose. But your connection to me did. Maybe it's, it's all four of those. I, I don't know. But the cause of what we're dealing with is certainly uncertain. And not only was its, what is its arrival unexpected and, 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 its, and its purpose or cause uncertain, its impact is undetermined. Its impact is undetermined. What are the long-term effects of COVID-19? Maybe it's a good time to remind us that having internet access doesn't make us a medical doctor. Hey, I don't know. Breathing problems, lung issues, more health issues, I don't know. What are the, what are the, the lasting impacts of, of vaccines or not having a vaccine? The long-term effects of what we've dealt with are uncertain, but that's not really the point. Because you see, when we reacted the way we did, when we dealt with it the best way we knew how, we brought a series of decisions to light that we're now dealing with the impact of that, aren't we? And I don't know how long we'll deal with it. I don't know how far into the future that we'll deal with it. We can't know the end because I'm not sure we know the beginning. You see, if, if we consider the fact that, that we don't know the cause, all right? We don't know why it happened. Is this, is this God mandated so that we learn, so that someone is humbled, so, so that sin runs its course? If that's the case, did, did what we're dealing with start in 2020? Did it start in 2019? Did it start with the election of 2016 or 2020 or 2008 or 2012 or no election at all? 
Since we don't know when it began, we certainly can't know when it's going to be over. And think about Bible pandemics or, or Bible crises. Most of them are not just two years long, are they? I know that we read them on the pages of Scripture and we read a verse or a chapter and we read about 40 years or 70 years. And it's, and it's just like the, the blink of an eye. Friends, we've been in this at least the way we see it for two years. What if it's 20 years longer? What if we're still talking about the impacts and the effect of our economy and our nation and, and, our, and our health 20 years from now? You see, we might have needed this before 2020, but we still need it now. Because we're still dealing with the impacts and the effects and the, and the outgrowth of all of these things. I'm not suggesting that masks are coming back or that we're going to start limiting our groups again to, to 10 or less. But our choices have created issues. Have you taken a flight lately? Has it been canceled? Maybe that's the effect and the impact of what we're dealing with right now. Have you tried to find certain items at the grocery store? Have you filled your car up with gas? Have you checked any investments, no matter how small they might be, that you've made into the stock market? We're still dealing with the impact and effects of the last two years. More importantly, have we surveyed the state of the church? Have we looked at attendance numbers pre-COVID and post-COVID, if we're post-COVID? There are people who were here who aren't here anymore. There were people who were working and faithful, and they're not working and faithful any longer. The church has been impacted. Live stream has been substituted for personal attendance, and I'm not sure we're any stronger for these changes. Discouragement still lingers in the heart of those who do assemble. The uncertainty of what's going to happen next and what the next consequence is going to be still rests in our minds. Isolation fooled us into thinking that we didn't need one another. But yet we believe that when we begin to be separated is when we begin to die. I don't say any of this to discount great work that has been done by so many during the last two years. And the faith that's been shown and the resolve that's been, been displayed. But if we're not done, then who else falls? Who else succumbs? What's the next shoe to drop? We need to learn to maintain faith and hope in the midst of a pandemic. And so our discussion again isn't too late. It's right on time. However... Every text that I would have chosen to cover on this subject has been covered at some, to at some point since Thursday night. I knew that by looking at the lineup. I knew it more by listening to lessons. So what do we do in conclusion? We can't just say ditto because preachers wouldn't do that. They're, they're going to take their time, right? They're, I don't preach full time anymore. I'm going to take my shot, all right? So, so it's not just ditto. So what are we going to do? Here's what I want. I just want to share with you a number of practical solutions based on the totality of what we've heard and studied, what we know about Scripture, and, and, and maybe a, a new verse or two along the way that we haven't considered this weekend already. Some of these are in the manuscript and some of them are not. But I'll start with this one. Number one, if we're going to maintain... The, 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 the commitment to God, trust in Him, hope in the future in the midst of uncertain times and, and pandemics and, and disease and separation, we're going to have to remember that the one who answers prayers is the one who created this physical world. Amen. See, we rest, we rejoice, we're identified by the promise of Jesus or the promise of God about Jesus in Genesis 3.15, aren't we? Man sins and he falls and God says, listen, I'm going to fix it. He doesn't say this, but he's not going to fix it on our timetable. He's not going to fix it the way we probably think that he would, but he's going to fix it. And we, we trust, right? We rejoice in, we sing about, we preach about the hope that we have because God fulfilled that promise. Because he worked through men like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and David to bring about one who would cure the world of their greatest issues, their greatest problem, fix the sin problem that started in the garden. 
And we trust in that. We believe in that. Our very definition, of, of the very definition of who we are and what we claim to be is, is found in the, that promise and our trust in it. In fact, when problems come in this physical world, we often pray like John did, don't we? Come quickly. Because that's how much confidence we have in that promise. And yet, when it comes to praying for physical things, such as disease and financial ruin and, 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 and physical isolation. I'm not sure why we struggle with that, but we do. I think sometimes we believe that, that those things are too trivial for a God as great as our God. That they're too personal for a God as great as our God. And so we believe that we just have to endure. We just have to make it through. And if I can just hang on and be faithful in this life, then maybe I'll be relieved in the next, but I'm, I'm stuck with where I'm at. Friends, that is not the God that we serve. That is not the system of Christianity that he authorized. He desires that we bring all of our petitions and all of our cares, all of our worries and struggles, and we lay them at his feet. In fact, if we do think that way about physical calamity and problems, we'll either not pray... Or we'll pray prayers of doubt that are warned against in James chapter 1. Not really believing that God's going to help. Not really trusting that he's going to fix it. Did you know that in that same book, the example of prayer that we're given in chapter 5 is the prayer of Elijah? And it's a prayer for physical rain? For something that, that affects economy and crop growth and, and, and our, our comfort level here on earth? God wants that prayer. In fact, he inspired James to teach us to pray like that about those physical things and problems. Paul prayed for physical issues. Jesus prayed for physical relief. Who better is equipped to send the rain than the one who created the world? And when it comes to the things that we've been facing, who, who's more equipped to fix a virus that you can't see without a microscope than the one who created the human body? You see, David often asked for relief, but he also said in the Psalms that you have formed me, you know me, you created me, and it gave David confidence to pray that prayer. And if we're going to defend the Genesis account of creation, it needs to be accompanied by confident prayer that God can heal the physical problems that we have. He created us, he knows us, who better to answer those prayers? Before we move on to the next one, I want you to consider with me for just a moment what Jesus did in portions of his ministry on earth, it, I believe is a powerful concept and thought. There are some, some texts in, in this littered throughout the Gospels. One of them is in Matthew 9, 35, where, where the statement's made that they brought Jesus all of the disease and all the sick from the village that they were in, and he healed them. Now, have you ever stopped to think that in the life of Jesus, in the time that he lived on the earth, that there were certain villages in Galilee that had absolutely no sickness in them? for at least some stretch of time, that everyone was healed, that everyone was made well? Do you realize that, that that's actually the promise of when Jesus comes back and, and, and sin and death are finally defeated, is that we're actually going to be in a place where there's no sin and, and, and death? Jesus was giving us a prelude to what eternity is going to be like. That's his desire. Listen, if he came and healed and he's going to create a place where there is no sickness and death, then why wouldn't we pray for relief from it now? That's the God he is. That's what he wants to do. The God who created this physical world is the one who answers prayers, and I should pray those prayers. There's another thought, too, that we can add to that, is that sometimes when we, when we read the Gospels, we see the miracle and, and, and the lack of sickness and resurrection as the abnormality in the story, Right? I mean, everyone gets sick and everyone dies and everyone suffers and Jesus comes along and every now and then he interjects and, and he takes it away. The leper's healed, the lame walks, and that's the abnormality. You know, really, the abnormal thing is the sin and the death and the sickness. What's normal to God is life. What's normal to God is, is resurrection. What's normal to God is healing. So if we're going to pray, we need to pray with confidence because the one who he answers prayers is the one who created this physical world. But number two, if I'm going to be ready for, for pandemic and have hope and faith in the midst of it, I'm going to have to be ready for the answer that God gives. 
you can turn to if you would like to. I know that this isn't textually based, but, but there's a statement that's made, and I didn't notice it until this week, didn't really think about it in preparation for this lesson until a couple of days ago. But when it hasn't rained in, in the life of Ahab, or the king Ahab, and, 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 and the ministry of Elijah for three and a half years, and God calls Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 18, and he tells him in verse 1, Go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain. Now, I don't know, because I wasn't there, and the text doesn't reveal one way or the other, if his going to Ahab was going to be the catalyst for the rain. It, let's just say that Elijah says, listen, it's too scary, I'm not going, if God still withholds the rain. I don't know. Okay? I don't know how that works. But it seems to be in the text, he connects the two, right? You go to Ahab, show yourself in front of him, the king who would love nothing more than to kill you, and his wife would too, and then I'll send rain. Now, imagine the reaction being, listen, I understand that that's a prayer that needs to be answered, but you're asking too much of me. I can't go to Ahab. I, I'm, I'm, I'm fear for my life anyway. If I walk into his presence and give him an open shot, I, I'm done for. Listen, if we're going to pray for relief, we need to be ready for the answer that God gives and courageous enough to step through it. Now, we know Elijah stepped through it. The rain came and... They didn't live happily ever after, but you know the, the end of the story. I want to share something with you tonight that I haven't shared publicly. Um, it'll start with this. The hands of a hypocrite type this manuscript. This will be hard for me to say to you. But when I was assigned this, I wrote it from an academic, what I knew of God and knew of the Bible standpoint and not how I felt. And if you're a preacher who preached through 2020 and 2021, maybe you can identify. There were countless days that I sat alone in an office, that I preached to a camera that I get, didn't get to go to the hospital when my brethren were suffering and struggling. I didn't get to go welcome new babies in, into the world with, with families because we couldn't go. We couldn't be there. I didn't realize it until months later. But I'm not sure I had ever been more discouraged in all of my life. The, pow the real and powerful and repeated feeling of inadequacy and inability didn't just show up, it camped out. And it sunk down into my heart, and it lived for a long time. In a moment, or in moments of self-inflated worth and pride, I had to fix it. I had to get people back in the building. I had to get programs going back in the congregation. I had to do this. And, and, and it didn't even say it like this, but I alone must have been the one saddled with that. I was the one sitting there by myself all day. I was the one agonizing about these things. And so I prayed. It was actually one secular job offer away from ministry being what I used to do. Not what I do. And so I prayed. And I prayed for an answer and a way out and relief, worth, adequacy. And on October the 14th, and I, I know the date because I saved the text. There was an answer to a text on my phone from Denny. It was just a text about lectureship. And he said... I hear maybe we should talk about, again about you coming out here. And I know with, with all of my heart that that text was an answer to prayer. Because what happened after that is then you're saddled with this, I've got to raise support now. And so the Lord introduced me to people I had never met. 
And for eight months, I had to go before elderships and members and individuals and say, we want to go to Bear Valley and we need you to partner with us. And, and, I, and I saw the Lord's people active and thriving and alive. And I didn't have to fix them. I didn't have to revive them. That wasn't my, my, my place. In fact, what they were doing for me was reviving my spirit and my confidence. In fact, before we even told the elders at university, we went back to where I grew up in North Mississippi. We were going to tell our family before we announced anything back home. And we stayed with two people that are sitting in this assembly tonight. And we told them. And as we were leaving that morning to go back home, they handed us an envelope with these words, we want to be your first supporters. And then they booked their tickets to the lectureship. Then. If we want to maintain faith and hope in the midst of a pandemic, we better trust the answer God gives us when we pray. Because you know that answer meant? That answer meant leaving 15 years of family made in San Marcos. And literally family with two daughters, two son-in-laws, and two grandsons. But God has healed my heart because of it. Be ready to accept his answer. Number three, and our time is running out. Remember that our God is always bigger than our fear, whether we realize it or not. Now, I mentioned something in the manuscript, and Carla, I'm still not going to sing it if you can hear me. My children grew up watching Veggie Tales. I don't know if your children did or not, or still do. Um, if, if they do, and I just mentioned Veggie Tales, maybe you can envision a singing cucumber and a dancing tomato and get a visual image of what that was like. But there was a, a song that another character on that show, Junior Asparagus, used to sing. It's crazy that I still know those names. <laughs> but the song was God is Bigger Than the Boogeyman. And the lyrics express that, that he's bigger than the, 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 the monsters on TV. And we'll sing that as, as a small child, but then as we grow up, we lose some faith in it. And God's bigger than economic downfalls and regime changes and, 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 and microorganisms. He's bigger than all of it. And the fear that comes with it, he can wipe it away. He, he can eradicate it. That's the God that we serve. Listen to the language of Scripture. He who is able to do above or more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. Ephesians 3 and verse 20. Nothing is too difficult for you. Jeremiah 32, 17. No one can thwart your purposes. Job 42 in verse 2, there's nothing too big for God, nothing will last longer than God, and nothing is more deadly that God can't overcome it. It doesn't take a child's song to remind us of that. Our God is greater than our fears, at least he should be. I realize that you and I have faced some new challenges. I don't ever remember the, the history of my time on earth, the CDC being so involved in public policy. I never remember that, ever. And maybe it happened. I'm I'm not politically complaining. I just don't remember it happening. Never had to wait in line outside of a grocery store. Never had to worry about how many rolls of toilet paper I could buy. And if there would be any there when it ran out at home. Didn't have to worry about that. I've never, I've never paid so much attention to, 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 to numbers and, and statistics and health reports and overflowing hospitals. I've never seen it. What was the reaction of the church? I guess that depends on where you were, right? But at best, I believe we were pessimistic. And at worst, we were defeated. How will we ever get through this? How will we ever overcome it? We'll never be the same. Friends, the Lord's church didn't change in the pandemic. His people may have done some things that they wish they had done differently, but the church can't be defeated by disease. It can't, be, it can't be overcome by regime changes. It will always be what it is. And we need to live that out so that the world sees that. Rather than sees the fear that accompanies it. So that leads me to number four. I'm just trying to get through these so that you are not here all night. We're going to be ready for pandemic and 
distress, have faith and hope in the midst of it. We need to spend more time together, not less time together. As God's people. It was interesting, I, I found a book, and I don't even remember how I came across it. It was entitled Analog Church, and I, and I read it in the midst of pandemic. It was one of those I read because I couldn't do anything else. I couldn't go anywhere and couldn't, couldn't, couldn't visit hospitals, and, 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 and we weren't meeting together regularly. And, and I found this book. It was actually written before the pandemic. But the entire purpose of the book was to address this movement among more community-based churches in, in, our, in our world to, to, in, to, instead of planning new churches, of making satellite churches and streaming their services from one mother location to all over the city. But the premise of the book to avoid that was a deep study of how you and I need to be face-to-face, shoulder-to-shoulder, and arm-in-arm to grow as Christians. That it doesn't happen through video feeds. And, and, and I have, that book is, is completely highlighted, and, and, and I even emailed the author. I don't know how it came to be that that book was written before the pandemic and then published during the pandemic, but it's been a blessing in my life. There are a number of things that he mentions there. For example, he, he mentions the idea that, that with the rise of live stream, these kind of phrases are heard. We need to have easy access, be on multiple platforms, and be user or visitor friendly. And he made this statement. Friends, these Phrases are phrases of commodity, not phrases of community. I'm thankful. I have family members who, who, who wouldn't, wouldn't darken the doors of a church building and, and hear me preach, who are watching online to lessons that I preach and sermons that my dad preaches, and I'm thankful for that. But the church doesn't grow because of that. The church isn't strengthened. We still need to be together. We still need to be with one another. and We need to spend more time, not less time. Transformation, he would say, is always an in-person experience together with one another. And my favorite line is this, we are bound together. We didn't choose it, we are saved into it. And we need to spend more time, more time building one another up and getting to know one another, knowing the struggles and problems that we have, so that when we come back together and a seat is empty, we don't just assume that someone is sick. We don't just assume they're watching online. We don't just assume they're going to another congregation. But we're so invested in their life that we know as much about them as possible. We blend together and we share together. And so when the next pandemic comes, or when the next wave of this one rolls out, we can be there for one another. And we can take care of one another. And we can depend on one another. We need to spend more time together and not less. Then number five. We're going to have faith and hope in the midst of a pandemic. We're going to have to remember that the greatest gift has already been given. How would you describe, if you had had just all the words in in, in your vocabulary at your disposal, how would you describe the events of 2020, 2021, of the, the coronavirus pandemic? Would you use words like tribulation and distress? Did it cause hunger or danger or conflict? If so... The Bible addresses what these things can and can't do to our relationship with God, don't they? Romans 8 clearly says that these things can't separate us from Him. They don't change our state in Him. So we've lived through a number of those words that Paul used to describe the the, the plight of living in this world and and, and suffering the, the consequences of sin. He's already said those don't impact us. But do you know what he says a few verses before that? And Mike did a great job this morning in, in, in helping us see the power and promises of God from Romans 8. But did you see what he said earlier in the passage? If God has given us his son, will he not also freely give us all things? Friends, if God has already given us the feast, then he'll give us the snack. If he's already filled our cup to overflowing with the abundance of anything we could ask for, he'll give us a cup of water. My physical problems, my financial problems, they're problems and they're difficulties, but they're nothing in the sight of God, and he's already freely given us everything else. Why wouldn't he answer that prayer? Why wouldn't he add to that and share with us and give us those things? That's the God that we serve. There's no provision that God will withhold from those that love him which they need. Now, what he might tell us is we don't need it. Living in a land flowing with milk and honey, maybe we don't need all the milk and honey we think we need. 
But if he's already given us his son, will he not then fix our lesser problems? You see, that sin problem is the greatest problem that man has. And, and if you're here tonight and didn't know it, God fixed it. He handled it. He sent his son to the cross to die in our stead. And, and, and if your sin's not covered tonight, we're going to sing an invitation song in just a moment. You can walk this aisle. You can make known your request to, to know him better. We'll study with you. And, and I would assume before the night's over, we'll go to the waters of baptism and your sin will be taken away. Because of what God's already done. But because this is a Sunday evening, and I know a large majority of you in here, I think we've already benefited from that promise. But maybe there's something else you need tonight. Maybe there's a struggle that you're having or, or an issue that you're facing or, or a question that, that's on your heart. And you've thought for so long, no one cares about that. And so you've lived with it. You've buried it. Maybe it's led to discouragement, discontentment, lack of worth and confidence in God. Listen, there are multiple people that care about that issue, whatever it is in your life. And it starts with the people sitting in this room. But ultimately, it rests at the throne of heaven. God cares. And we care. And if we can help, we invite you to come while we stand. Thank you.